Mark chapter uh, 16. Mark chapter 16. Y'all, y'all, are you having an expectation for the word today? Amen. You know, preaching uh, is going to happen. How it impacts you is determined on your expectation. Amen. And so um, I encourage you, when we come through verses you've heard before, say, ah, something must be spoken today that I haven't heard yet. Amen. Amen. In fact, the, one of the number one reasons why I love to minister is to discover what I have not yet studied uh, because I have come to find out in the corporate anointing, okay, um, that there are things that you have going on in your life that I'm unaware of, but when I begin to minister, God begins to release it for you. And in the process, I learn, and I love that. I love to be able to pull things up because of your hunger, your desire to know the word that, all, that I did not know. Now, once I say it, man, I typically get it. I'm like, now nah, I've learned that. Man, and I'll be able to say that again, communicate that again. God will pull that up to my remembrance again. But initially in the study, it wasn't there. It wasn't there, amen? And God's not obligated to tell me everything that you need to hear before you get here. In fact, today at 9.50, uh, I didn't have a scripture down. In fact, when I did a leadership lesson with the worship team today, I said, let me show you my sermon. I showed them a blank piece of paper. Now, why do I say that? Many times I have scripture long in advance. But at the end of the day, this is not my church. This is the one Jesus is building. And I have to yield to him. And this morning, when I had time to continue to study, I had this impression I should just go and pray in the spirit. First, most of the time, God will give me a word, then I pray in the spirit after. But today, it seemed right with me and the Holy Ghost that I abandon comfort and just go pray. So I took off, went down the road, watched the sun rise this morning. Amen. And as a result of that, I just trusted God and then come here, you know, and here we are going into it. And I'm like, man, Lord. Well, whatever. <laughs> Amen. You understand? It's easy to be in peace when you know that he's the one that's responsible. But you just cast your care on the Lord. Amen. People have a hard enough time even when they have points to get up in front of people, right? Um, but at the end of the day, the Lord has given me something to say to you today. And I do believe it is for a time such as this. Amen. Amen. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 20, it says this. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out de demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and set down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord working what? what working what? With them and confirming the word through the accompany signs. What signs are we talking about? That they would cast out devils. They would speak with new tongues. If they took up any deadly serpents or drink any deadly thing, it would by, by no means hurt them. They would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. Amen? These signs were accompanying them. Now, the question, though, that we need to ask, because it is an assumed thought process, and we have learned here at Anchor Faith Church, that it is an assumption. But before I get to that thing, I want to go back to verse 18, and it, uh, or actually verse 17. It says, and these signs will follow those who believe. Let me ask this question. Are you a believer? Yes. Then if you are a believer, these signs should follow you, which tells me these signs did not disappear after the original apostles. So that, that teaching is an error. When people want to act like 
that the moves of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit are not for the church today. They were only for the 11 plus Matthias that came in as the 12th one. However, Paul was not one of the original 12 anyway, and he spoke in tongues more than them all. But then there were tons of prophets that were actually mentioned in the book of Acts that were not part of the original 12 that had the ability to flow in the gifts of the Spirit to the point that even Agabus tied up and prophesied uh, about a, um, a word of wisdom of what would take place to Paul before, when he got to Jerusalem. Not to mention that Paul's letter to the Corinthian church was on the subject of the gifts of the Spirit of which all the saints were functioning in it in such a way that Paul had to bring it back in order. Are you hearing me? So, are you a believer? Then these things are for today because the church is still alive today. I said the church is still alive today. The church is still alive today. Now, why do I stress this? Because we take verse uh, 15 to preach the gospel as if it's only a word and not a demonstration. Because if you accept or if you do not expect the signs to accompany, then you aren't looking for them to accompany. All you are doing is releasing a word. God never intended us to go preach the gospel without a demonstration. At least having access. Now, what I'm not saying is that every time you preach the gospel that you have to have a demonstration. I'm not saying that because Jesus himself preached some things without demonstrations. Now, why did he do that? Because they wanted just the demonstrations. So there are people that God knows that he is not there to give them a demonstration. He's there to give them the word because they need the word to change their life. They're looking for the wrong thing. But for some, they need the accompanying demonstration that helps them believe so that they can come into the kingdom and God has equipped us to do this. Can I get a better amen than that? He has equipped us to do this. We need to have a daily expectation of the supernatural. Daily. I said a daily expectation of the supernatural. That there's not a place in life or that we could encounter in any 24-hour period that God could not allow an accompanied sign. In fact, if God is working with you, then you could have an expectation of an accompany sign. Because here's the thing. God is not sending you out without him. So if you're going out without him, then you might want to get out of his field. And we'll get to that here in a minute. But verse 15, the problem is it says, go into all the world and preach the, not a gospel, but the gospel. The gospel. Say the gospel. the gospel. Say the gospel. The gospel. The gospel. The gospel. The gospel. Not a gospel. Not a part of the gospel. But the gospel. And again, we read this. And again, you would think that people would know what the gospel is. But most people only know part of it. They only know a door. They only know an entrance. They don't know the gospel. Jesus preached the gospel, and it tells us. Look at this in Matthew chapter 9 and see if Jesus is not doing what Mark 16 tells us to do. Look at this. In Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 35, it says this. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the what? But what is the gospel? Of the kingdom. Not just good news, he actually didn't preach, believe I'm going to die and raise from the dead for your sin. Jesus never preached that. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. Now, let me just stop right here because, you know, I already hear the religious brakes hitting. 
Did Jesus die on the cross to make payment for our sin? Absolutely. He is the only way into the kingdom. But Jesus preached the kingdom, not just his assignment. And this is very important. Because most of the time we're only preaching Jesus' assignment and people are, are looking at an assignment and not looking at what he brought because he completed the assignment. So he goes on and says this, teaching in their synagogue, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And because he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom, what took place? And healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Right? Jesus said, if I cast out a devil with the finger of God, then you know the kingdom is here. Are you hearing me? Jesus was casting out devils, healing the sick, raising the dead. Why? Because he preached the gospel of the kingdom. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like this and the kingdom of God is like that. He was always saying to the people, let me talk to you about God's domain or the king's domain, the king's dominion. Let me talk to you about what you're waiting for. Let me tell you about this Messiah that you're looking for. Let me tell you about this kingdom that you want to get in. Let me talk to you about the kingdom that is ever present in your midst and what you need to do to become a part of it. Are you hearing me? See, at Anchor Faith Church, if you don't watch out, you can get numb to kingdom. Because once again, it becomes a word that has been preached here so often that the minute it starts, we disconnect. However, it is the only thing that remains. That's like me getting rid of the name of Jesus. I remember one time someone came to me and said, you don't talk about Jesus much. I said, I talk about Jesus all the time. He is the king of the kingdom. Jesus is the king. Now, why is that? Because everyone loves Savior Jesus. But Lord Jesus is a whole nother ballgame. Because Savior is what Jesus did. Lord is who he is. In the beginning, we know The kingdom is about dominion because the Bible is only about a king, his kingdom, and his royal offspring. Listen to me. The day is here and upon us that we cannot get tired. And not everyone knows the gospel like you know the gospel. And it's very important for you to be able to recite it and know it and articulate it in in a way that when you're around people, you can begin to divulge the kingdom because it's the kingdom that transforms and changes people's lives. And it's the kingdom that Jesus is bringing back in the first place. Are you hearing me? So Jesus says, verse 36, but when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And he says to his disciples, the harvest is what? Plentiful, but the laborers are, what are they? Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So the laborers are, the laborers are, the laborers are few. Now, one reason why the labors are few is not because there's not a number of them. We've preached this in the past, but again, just so you can know as a review, uh, and for those who've never been here, uh, obviously we have farmland in our county. And, um, you know, at one time, I don't know that it is today, but Hastings was the potato capital of the world, right? And potatoes are like under the ground, right, Mr. Barry? I mean, they're like a root, right? Now, I don't see the potato, when it's in the ground. How in the world does a farmer know without seeing it that it's ready to pick? That we're not gonna get a little scrawny one. Are you hearing what I'm saying? How is it that they know when the cabbage head next week is ready but not this week? That if we do it this week, it's too early. How do they know collard greens are ready when they're ready? Because to an untrained eyes, we just get out and say, ah, it looks good. And we can pick the fruit before it's actually ripe. And if you pick fruit before it's ripe, if anyone eats it, it is bitter. 
or it doesn't taste as it was supposed to. And I'm concerned that there are a lot of people that are out preaching a gospel and are pulling things off the Lord's harvest before they're ready to be picked. In fact, we are rushing them into the sides of the convenience stores or their cars or whatever, and we say these things like, where are you going to go when you die? How do you know? If you were to die today, where would you go? And you, you, how do you know that you didn't get hit by a car? And we're like scaring them to make a confession, and we're like proud of ourselves. Now, the Bible's very clear. It is highly possible. In fact, it is doable to confess with your lips and your heart be far from it. For Jesus himself said about the Pharisees, they confess me with their lips, but their heart, which means their confession isn't actually pulling in the results. And you can labor over someone that you think needs to be harvested because you've discovered that they would go to hell if they die today and you pound so much that they say, I'll pray with you and they're really just confessing so you will leave them alone. Then you give them this false sense of security. And now when you die, you're going to go to heaven. And yet they're not actually in the kingdom at all. In fact, Jesus warned uh, the disciples concerning the Pharisees. He says, man, they make a proselyte twice the son of hell. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hallelujah. So it's his field. In Mark 16, it says the Lord's laboring with us. So again, It's not my responsibility to go tell everyone about Jesus. It's my responsibility to tell who God tells me to tell people about Jesus and to determine how far I communicate. Because as Paul clearly said, Apollos planted, I watered, but God caused the increase. So your emotional experience and seemingly concerned that if they died today, they would go to hell. Well, do you think the Lord knows whether they're going to die today? I mean, we put pressure on people that even God doesn't put pressure, pressure on. I mean, seriously, how many times has the Lord kept you? That you could look back in your life of sin and you're like, man, but God, I should be dead. But God, he was, he was merciful. I mean, he wasn't like, bro, you better accept me now. No, he's the Lord of the? He's like, man, if I didn't step in here, they'd be dead today. But instead, I did because I'm merciful and I got a laborer coming. I got one that's actually going to be able to speak to their heart, chip away at this heart of stone, water a little bit, plant a little bit, because I know it's going to be on this day. We don't have to pressure. We just have to represent the kingdom. And here's the thing. When you understand the gospel is about the kingdom, then there's no more pressure in your harvesting. No more. Because the gospel is not about where you're going to go when you die. Because every religion is asking that question. And that's not the gospel Jesus preached. Jesus was not preaching, where are you going to go when you die? Jesus was, let the kingdom come to you now. Jesus was not preaching, I need you to come to heaven. Jesus was saying, now when you pray, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom, your will be on as it is. He's prayed in John chapter 17, Father, I'm not even asking you to take them out of the world. So let me tell you, King Jesus, who's seated on the throne right now, is not in a rush to get you to him. What he wants is you to fulfill God's plan for your life while you're here. And he doesn't want you there any sooner. Because at the end of the day, he's already given you enough to thrive. 
Because salvation is not about heaven. Salvation is about becoming a child of God and having God. If we look at the scripture, you guys know that God always came down. He always came down, which brings us to this thought that we've said here for years in Genesis 1, Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let him have what? Dominion. Dominion. Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over all the cattle, over every creepy thing that creeps on the earth, over all the earth. He made both male and female. They both would have dominion. They're on a planet with no sin. It's perfect. And God says this, son, I want to know that you love me. So in order for me to know you love me, you are going to stay in obedience. So here's my thing. Uh, You can eat from any tree of the garden. You can have it all. All this fruit yours, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For the day you eat, you will surely die. And every time he passed the tree and did not eat it, he was demonstrating God's love to him. For Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my word. So if the Lord says to him, Adam, you can eat from any tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day you eat that fruit, you die. If Adam had never eaten the fruit, where would he be today? So Adam wasn't walking around looking for heaven because heaven came to earth. I said heaven came to earth. And you know, if you actually read the Bible, back of the book, guess what? God's coming to planet earth. He really loves this place way more than we do. Our religion has tried to get us out of it and God's kingdom's about keeping us in. Now, will you go to heaven when you die? Sure. To be absent from the body, you'll be what? Present with the Lord. Where is Jesus presently at? He's in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. He's on a throne. Thrones are in uh, kingdoms, not in religions. But is Jesus staying there? He is not. Is he returning? Yes, the king is coming. I said the king's coming. And he will not come as a suffering servant. He will not come uh, as a lamb to be slain. He's coming as the reigning king who has conquered the devil and is going to fully establish his kingdom on the earth forever, physically. Hallelujah. And And we have the privilege as sons and daughters of God to function in that kingdom now, even in a world fallen from dominion. Amen. So we preach the gospel Jesus preaches because the gospel is about the kingdom of God, because the Bible was always about a king, his kingdom and his royal offspring. And Adam was not trying to get somewhere. Somewhere came to him. But when Adam did eat the fruit, God had to keep his word because God is not a man that he should lie. And if he said, let man have dominion, now that Adam has abdicated his throne, given it to the devil, the Lord says, I need man to have a pathway back so my word can be fulfilled. And so he said, son, you'll have to go be a man. That's legal entrance. I gave it to a man and he lost, he He didn't lose it. He gave it away. It's going to require a man to take it back. But we can't use his seed because it's corrupt. So I will put you in a woman by the Holy Ghost. And you're going to empty yourself and you're going to be all man anointed of the spirit and function in the planet. And if you study the miracles that Jesus performed, they are all within the dominion that the first Adam lost. Every one of them is the dominion the first Adam had. And if Jesus has conquered the devil, and he has, and he has been given all authority, and he can give his authority to us, then guess what we can do in the earth as well? We conquer the enemy. Amen. We conquer based upon the our knowledge of God. Look at this in John chapter 4. Why do I bring all this up? Because we're never too tired. So it came... So he, this is Jesus, came to the city of Samaria near a parcel of ground that Jacob had, gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, look what it says about Jesus. Jesus being what? Wearied by his journey or from his journey was sitting thus by the well It was about the sixth hour. Then came a woman from Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Why are they buying food? Because Jesus is weary from his journey. 
Jesus is the son of man. He emptied himself of his glory. He is a man functioning underneath the anointing of God. And he physically was tired. Jesus got physically tired. And Jesus was wearied. In essence, he's, they know he's hungry. That's why they're buying him food. They leave him here. I mean, he's so tired that he doesn't even go with his disciples. He's like, y'all go ahead. I'm, I'm going to stay here. So it's not just because someone's coming. In fact, at this point, we don't even know if Jesus technically knows that she's coming yet. He could be at the well simply because he's wearied. I'm tired. I'm just going to rest. Y'all go get it, and I'll be here when you get back. Then all of a sudden, a lady comes. And when this lady shows up, he starts hearing from heaven. I said he starts hearing from heaven. Now, what are you going to do when you start hearing from heaven, but you're tired? I worked all week. I've worked all day and I have to run down to the grocery store to get some for our kids. And now you're in the grocery store and you're tired. And all of a sudden, heaven starts talking to you. You're at the game with your child because he's practicing. And you're like, my gosh, man, I just want to go home. I mean, seriously, I don't even really know why I have this child of mine in the soccer because they are horrible. <laughs> Come on, parents, just be honest. <laughs> You'll get it next week. <laughs> you're encouraging them, right? Maybe you should take piano. <laughs> Anyway, the point is, is you're investing in your child there. And all of a sudden there's another parent. And you're weary, but heaven starts talking. I said, heaven starts talking. See, I believe most Christians would love for the pastor to organize the evangelism. Because then you're only going to be evangelistic when we have the event. But this is not how true evangelism works. And this is not how the harvest works. This is not how God wants to pull people in the kingdom. Because again, being weary is your best moment to be able to get into a place of sustenance that food cannot do for you. The problem is, if you would take serious laboring in the harvest, you would find yourself coming out of weariness. Because many of us, especially in the realms of Christians, they are going to vacations, they are taking days off, they're laying out at the beach, they're going on their boats, they're disconnecting because I'm tired where I need to Yet, Jesus will give us insight that you can tap into a place. That those places really won't satisfy you anyway. I mean, how many people have to have a vacation from your vacation? Especially if you have kids. We're taking our kids to Disney. Uh, ha! That's fun. Standing long lines, your child's going to whine and cry. You know, you're going to tell them. And you're going to tell the whole, you know, Disney crowd, you know, oh, they're just tired when they're acting like a crazy one, you know, and screaming and throwing a fit and pitch. Oh, they're just tired. They're just tired. Well, then why'd you take them there? <laughs> Say amen anyway, amen. right? I mean, we put ourselves in all kinds of things fun for them and that's not even fun for them. <laughs> and then you get back and you're like, wow, that was the most exhausting vacation we ever had. <laughs> amen. Yeah, you just want to go back to work. This is why they during during this is why during Christmas they had that one little Christmas song, you know, um, uh, where it's like and and mom and dad are ready for the kids to go back to school, right? I mean, we've developed such a society that we're glad when they're away from us. Okay, 
Yet these are the times we're supposed to be refreshed. Well, there's only one place that you can get refreshed. Truly refreshed, amen. Now, I'm not against vacations, do them, but as long as you don't vacation from God. I do more with God on vacation than I do when I'm even here because then I don't have other people pulling on me. Are you hearing me? So again, he's tired, wearied, but there, here comes a woman and heaven starts talking to him and he says, would you give me something to drink? Now, this is controversial right out the gate, people. As you know, this context of scripture, she's like, wait a minute, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, you don't even talk to me. You guys are prejudiced, right? You're racist. Y'all don't talk to me. I mean, here you are going to carry on. Con Not only am I Samaritan, I'm a woman on top of that. Are you hearing me? But when the disciples came back, they're like, he's talking to a woman. Right? <laughs> so he goes on and, and begins to unveil things. What happens? Ultimately, heaven's talking to him. And in order for her to get over to a place, he has to start functioning in the gifts. He said, well, go ahead and bring your husband back. And she said, oh, I don't have a husband. He says, you say correctly, you don't have, have a husband. You've actually had five. But the one you would now is definitely not your husband. And what does she do? I perceive you are a prophet. <laughs> now, let me tell you, this is going to happen, guys. The minute you start talking kingdom, right? And what I'm saying is when you let kingdom influence start happening in your life, the minute they're like, first of all, just debating with you about just general things. Wow, I can't even believe that you're asking me for water, you know? And he's like, man, if you knew who I was and the gift I was, I, you'd be asking me for water. He's like, bro, you don't even have a bucket. I don't even know what you're talking about right now, right? And he says, man, my junk doesn't ever run out. Well, won't you give me this so I never have to come to this well anymore? And it's like a spigot in my house. You know, we have running water today. Um, I just turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, right? Anyway, with that being said, you know, but we're talking about spiritual things. She didn't understand that. So in order for him, him to kick her over into spiritual, he had to get personal. And sometimes in the harvest, you got to get personal. At the expense of getting them being offended. Are you hearing me? She, she could have already, because she understands there's a race issue. There's discrimination happening between our people. And now you, oh, you gonna talk to me about my husbands? You think I'm trash? You think I'm all this? She, I mean, she could have responded that way. Right? Come on now. Oh, you gonna talk to me about my relationships? But what does she do? She's like, well, I perceive you're a prophet because obviously there's no way you'd have known that unless you are tapping into the throne room. So at that point, as he unloads who she is, she doesn't believe. She begins to jump over into spiritual questions. And you ever got around somebody when you start getting personal and then they start to find out that you actually are a believer, then they obviously want to start talking the Bible and what they know. And she does that. Well, you know, they say. <laughs> and he says, look, you got it all wrong, girl. <laughs> Salvation comes from us, but you got to understand there's coming a day when he is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Are you hearing me? And she says, well, I hear the Messiah's coming. And then he lays it out. First time he ever announces his kingship. The first time he ever announces it. And he tells a woman, he says, I am the Messiah. And man, when she hears those words, notice what he didn't say. I am the one who's going to die on the cross and be raised from the dead so that your sins will be forgiven. What he says is, I am the Messiah. The Messiah is the Hebrew word that the Greek equivalent is the Christ. Christ is not last name. Messiah is not last name. Both of those are titles. And they literally mean the king. And when I say literally, they mean the anointed one in his anointing, okay? But what is that? Well, God anointed kings. He, the Lord said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has what? 
anointed me. So when the Father opened up heaven and the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, that was his coordination. That was his crowning. That was his anointing as king of the earth. And his father says, this is my son. I'm the king. And this is my son who's king of the earth. He is king of the earth. He is anointed to be king of all the earth. Are you hearing me? And Jesus functioned underneath that anointing. Are you hearing me? So that anointing is flowing in him. Then we get down to verse 30. Look at this. Everybody doing all right? Verse 30. Say, I'm never too tired. They went out of the city and were coming to him. Now she's gone into the town telling everybody about this guy and saying the Messiah, the Christ, the one that's been prophesied is at the well, guys. And they're like, he's at the well? He's at the well. And they're like, well, let's go see what this woman's talking about. Now they believed her, and what I mean believed her, They were curious. They wanted to know because if they didn't believe her at all, they're like, I'm not going out there. See, true belief has action. So they believed her that he was there. So they acted on her words and showed up, but they did not believe in him till later. They believed for themselves later as he stayed with them two days. And they said, we believe now, not because of what this woman said, but we have heard your words ourselves." Wow. Are you hearing me? So now they're starting to come out to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to him, look what he says now. This is the guy who was weary. Journey all day. Had a busy day. I had a busy day. busy day. He said, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? And Jesus said, my food, say my food. My food. Come on, say my food. my food. Come on, say my food. My food. my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. If you want to get out of weariness, then you're going to have to eat the food of his will for your life. As long as you keep running around, trying to rest, trying to get your own rest, do your own thing, you're always going to be too tired. But Jesus, when he's tired, can tap into the will of his father and get strength that food can't even bring him. Are you hearing me? He says, he says, do not say there is yet four months and then the harvest come. Now look how he kicks over. He is saying, listen, I have food. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his purpose. And then he says, quit acting like you got more time. Quit hate, quit delaying what you're hearing from heaven because you're tired. He said, do not say that there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the field for they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice. What? Together. In essence, he's saying, listen, get out there because some places you're going to sow and someone's going to come in behind and reap. You do your part. They do their part. And we're going to get this thing done. But don't be sitting around saying I'm too tired. I mean, Christians are too tired to come to church. They spend so much time doing their work and kids and getting the head or whatever the case may be. And then God gets leftovers. Yet God's will for your life is to be in church so that you can release your gift. Now you'd be less weary if you showed up more. 
because it is the will of your father to assemble. It's the will of your father to be jointed and fitted with other believers. It is the will of your father to come and release your gift in the local body. And then it will equip you so that when you're out in the highway and the byways, you can hear from heaven accurately and you can pick right fruit instead of picking fruit that no, that ultimately is going to be bitter. Don't wait for an evangelistic moment. Be sensitive every day. But in order for you to maintain your sustenance or your drive, you've got to be eating the food that will su su suffice your weariness. And it is the only thing that will. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish do you understand it wasn't just the Father's assignment for Jesus to preach? That was one of them. It wasn't just Jesus' assignment to flow in the gifts of the Spirit, although it was one of them. It wasn't just Jesus' assignment to raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out devils, although he did all those. Those were parts of his assignment. Ultimately, his assignment is to die on the cross for us, Stand in the gap that that grain, that seed, that king kind would go into the earth so it could produce after its own kind, that we would be raised up to newness of life and we would be raised up to reign and to rule again and get back into the dominion that the first Adam lost. Jesus Christ made the way so that we could rule and reign in this life and the one to come. Amen. And so we are ever present to be hearing the Spirit of God, to do the will of the Father, because one of the things that we are tasked to do is to reconcile men to God. And there is this like uh, almost insatiable appetite, and that is ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of truth of people that want tidbits but don't live what they hear. They don't want to evangelize, or if they are evangelizing, they are evangelizing in fear and not in love. Because it is the kindness of God that draws men to repentance, not scaring the hell out of them. Are you hearing me? Now, with that being said, he goes on and says in verse 37, for in this case, the saying is true. One sows, another reaps. I send you to reap that for which you have not labored, others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Do you understand there is a season that is upon us that is allowing us to reap quicker because of all who have gone before as laborers. But if we are so consumed with our life, then we are going to find ourselves too weary to eat the food we're supposed to eat. And opportunities are going to pass by. Not because heaven's not talking. It's because you're acknowledging your tiredness. Are you hearing me? Now, again, I know that many of you are doing just this. You're taking time at your work. You're taking time at different places. You're sharing. You're communicating. Divine connections are happening. I just want you to be of good cheer. You have great reward because of that. And maybe, maybe you don't see them coming to the kingdom that day, but make no mistake about it. God, although the laborers are few, he works the la laborers work. I mean, you can't be a laborer and not work. But I'm not working. I'm a believer. Okay. Well, then you're not a believer because you're not working. You're afraid of a four-letter word. Work. Because you've been taught wrong about works. Amen. So John 17, 4 says this. Jesus said, I glorify you on the earth, talking about his father, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. You know, when I look at Pastor Hagen, who's 85 now, 85, and just went to Brazil 
He went to um, Guatemala. He went to Colombia. Just went there. 85. He's not an assisted living. I'm going to say that he's not in assisted living. Are you hearing me? He is out doing the will of his father. And it is sustaining him to do what most people have already checked out. Why? Because they only built their kingdom. They lived their life to serve their purpose, to have their retirement, to do their stuff. And yet, Pastor Hagen, 85, still driving on. I mean, he's kind of like Caleb. I'm well able to conquer this mountain. Let's do another international trip. Hallelujah. Amen. That should inspire you. That should give you passion. You understand? Don't look at the ones who are tired and quitting. Look at the ones that are saying, my food is to do the will of my father who sent me. I will not leave this earth empty uh, with carrying something. I'm going to do everything he's asked me to do. One, two, three. Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. Let's finish the course because there's too many people out there that need what you carry. They need it. So don't ever let yourself say, I'm too tired when heaven's talking. Are you hearing me? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6 says this, the hardworking farmer ought to be the what? First to receive his share of the crops. You know what's crazy? In churches today, if you don't watch out, they are just trying to eliminate older generation anyway, which is not the church of Jesus Christ because the church of Jesus Christ is multicultural or multi-ethnic or of every nation. You know, no, we shouldn't look the same. Everybody should, should be looking the same. There is nowhere in scripture where you will find that there's a black church or a white church or a Hispanic church. That doesn't exist in the kingdom. It's every tongue and tribe. That's what it looks like. But you know what else? <laughs> it's multi-generational. It's multi-generational. And in its, in its maturing, the younger are seeking the wisdom of the older and the older are empowering the younger because of their energy. But you know, when most churches like, oh, they're old, we don't even want them around. I mean, there's been whole church movements where they get rid of older people on the platform and only want younger people on it. Why is that? Why have we become so segregated in our thinking? Well, it's because a lot of the older ones are tired of working. And they've taken their workplace into the church. Well, you know, I've served with the children, you know, 15 years. I think I'm going to retire now. Well, what are you going to do? Well, I'm just going to sit in service. So God put all that in you to deploy, and now you're going to sit around. You're not going to invest in another generation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I've determined as I get older, I'm going to get better. Yes. I mean, if the Lord tarries another 30 years, you better watch out and see what I look like at 84. I'm telling you, I'm going to be a runner. I'm going to be like rocking this thing, man. I'm going to keep the suit strong. Amen. Now, you may be 30 and benching more than me on the weights, but at the end of the day, you're going to wish you could do what I do at 84. Are you hearing me? I'm telling you right now, I am strong in the Lord and the power of his might, and I'm not being pushed out. I got too much to bring. I got too much to carry. I got too much to do, but I'm not going to do it alone. We're not here to do it alone. We're here to raise up. I mean, I don't despise your youthfulness. Do not despise my gray hair. <laughs> I mean, let's accomplish something. Let's do something together. Let's go change and evangelize the world. Let's not get so tired and bring in our corporate America in how we do church. Let's do church Jesus's way. Because I can guarantee you this promise here in Galatians 
6, and we'll close with this one. In Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 9, do not lose heart in doing good. For in due time, we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, say, I have opportunity. You know how you know you have opportunity? Because you're breathing. You're breathing right now. You're breathing right now. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those, and especially, say especially, especially. to those who are of the household of the faith. Now, this verse is really, these two verses are really important that I want to close on today is this. Number one, don't lose heart because in, when it comes to ministry, when you're in the season between sowing and reaping of different things, even in vision, even in the accomplishment of the will of God for your life, you're going to get in seasons where things are going to come against you, attack, there's going to be certain things, and those things are there to press you, to put pressure on you, to try to get you tired, to try to get you to carry the load yourself, to become absorbed only with yourself and not others. And it's in those moments that you have to be the most intentional of staying good. Not retaliating, not seeking revenge, not trying to make sure that everybody understands about you. What you do is, you know what? I'm just going to seek the will of my Father. I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep doing what I've always been doing because God has always been faithful and this too shall pass and I'll overcome this too and I'll get through this trial as well and I'll come through this valley of the shadow of death. I'm going to get to the other side. We're going to get to where we need to be because there's too many lives at stake. There's too many people that need to be changed. There's, it's too important that I bring my supply and the opportunity is here because I'm breathing which means I will not let my age dictate my performance I'm not going to buy the lie I will be sufficient efficient and perform at high capacity all my life so I do not let the thoughts creep in you're getting older that's a mute point. That's irrelevant. Because I can thrive as long as I'm on purpose. Are you hearing me? Because, you know, some of you, you wake up a little slower. Now, I can say this because we've been here 20 years, and I can look at y'all. <clears throat> some of y'all been around for a while. Right? And at the end of the day, you got to go. You got to keep moving. You got to keep doing something. You got to keep performing. Because, again, when I was... 34 and started the church, I was actually in worse shape than I am now. But, you know, I come to find that every year I hit, it's really not that old. Because I lied to myself when I was young and act like it was old till I got here. And then I realized, this ain't old. Huh. Are you hearing me? Now, why do I say that? Because then I wouldn't have been so silly when I was young. Because when I was young, I was silly. I was young thinking, man, if I don't get this accomplished right now, because when I get, I won't do it when I'm older. And I didn't realize I'm moving into bigger and better things in my prime. Now, the only reason why people aren't doing it in their older age is because they start taking on account of their age. Well, does God talk to you about age? God just talks to you about purpose. Caleb didn't say, I wish somebody would take that mountain for me because, you know, I should have been in here when I was 40. When I was 40, bro, I mean, I was, I was like tip top. I was rocking this deal. But now, you know, I had to hang out in the wilderness for 40 years with all of you people. Now I'm 80. And now we've been fighting for five years, right? Because I had to help train all you guys. And now here I am 85, you know, uh, I would love to get a retirement home and I need some help. But what does he say to Joshua? Son, I'm taking my mountain. Are you, I am well able. I'm just as strong today at 85 as I was at 40. Because he never lost sight of the purpose. And one of the things we're losing sight is, is the ministry of reconciliation. 
that there's going to be a lot of times in your day to day when <sighs> that heaven's going to start talking. And it's your woman at the well. And let me tell you, the woman at the well was just the tip of the iceberg because the woman represented the city. Even though she was not a city official, even though she was not someone of renown, but she was the encounter that heaven wanted Jesus to speak to in the day he was weary. And Ramon, don't grow weary in your well-doing, son. Because if you'll talk to this woman, what I'm fixing to tell you that's going on in her life, then we can win that city. But notice what it cost him. A couple of days. Because instead of going on, they said, would you stay with us? And he intentionally stayed for two days to share about the kingdom and revival broke out in the city. I don't want to hear another saint talk to me about revival if you're not willing to do something different for two days. Nobody's serious about harvest because we got to click, click our little clock. Come in, click in. You don't do it here. I understand that. I'm preaching online now. You click in, click out. You want your little time frame, you know. You want your family, you want yours, want yours. And then heaven starts talking to you and it makes it uncomfortable. Now you got to have a detour for a couple of days. Jesus was like, this is why I'm here. I'm not here to build a house. I'm not here to amass wealth. I own it all anyway. And if we understand we're the children of the king, guess what? I can have a house, but I'm not here for that purpose. I can have wealth, but I'm not here for that purpose. I'm here to significantly change people's lives. And it's going to be in those days that I'm like, <sighs> that he says, don't get weary. Because harvest is right there, son. Harvest is there. What's another 20 years at Anchor Faith Church of the Lord, Terry? <clears throat> Fruitful labor. Amen. Fruitful labor. I said fruitful labor. Because at the end of the day, what are we doing anyway if we're not willing to invite others in to our family? And I say that because Anchor Faith Church is really good at establishing dominion. But we need to become even more equipped and purposeful about day-to-day -day evangelism. Sensitive for opportunities. Because what you know and what you experience and what you can distribute, deploy, the demonstrations, how in the world would we not be more full than even this? So I'm glad you're taking all your kids to the parks and playing all the sports. Because there's a world of people out there that need what you need. You're going to have to get bold. Listen from heaven. That person's in a wheelchair. Lord, do I need to go over there and raise them up? Now, he may say no, but at least ask. And if he says yes, then do it without doubting. But make sure you're here. Don't go over there and try to snatch somebody out and look like an idiot. Because you want it to be. And it's not what he said. Because he's the Lord of the harvest.